Thank you. Thank you so much, Courtney. So Courtney Thomas and the Women's Committee are a big part of the reason that I'm here. So thank you so much to Courtney and the Women's Committee and also to Scott Caulfield and Brad Schoenfeld who were part of that as well. So today we're going to be talking about women and body image, but first, conflict of interest statement. I have had an affiliation or financial interest with Girls Gone Strong as a co-founder and owner. So question for you all, what do you think body image is? Any suggestions or ideas? How you view your body, how you view yourself. How you view yourself or your body? Any other ideas? How you feel you're perceived. How, how you feel you're perceived by others. Any other ideas? Like the, the comparison between your body image, your body and society's uh, image of the body. The comparison between your body and society's idea of what a body looks like. Anybody else? So when we talk about body image, for the most part, people are thinking it's what we think about how our body looks. And while that is part of it, today I'd really like to expand your definition of body image a little bit. So five important factors affecting women's body image. Does she feel safe in her body? 30% of women are survivors of intimate partner violence, also known as domestic abuse. 81% of women in the U.S. have experienced harassment, and that number is as high as 98% in other countries, and 35% of women globally will, are survivors of sexual assault. You can imagine how these experiences would affect how a woman feels in her body and how she views her body. Does she feel comfortable in her body? This can be physical comfort, this can be emotional comfort. Does she experience chronic pain? illness, endometriosis, ovarian cysts, does she have painful periods? Does she have emotional discomfort in her body? Does she have mental illness, anxiety, depression, loneliness? All of these things affect how a woman feels in her body. Does she feel strong and capable? The tide is certainly shifting, but so many of us grew up thinking that strength, and specifically physical strength, is a masculine or manly trait. Did she grow up in a household? I see the women nodding their heads. Did she grow up in a household where she was taught that strength was for guys, that those were boys' jobs, that girls didn't play sports, that girls didn't lift weights, right? Did she grow up in an environment where she was taught that she could be strong and capable or that those were, those were things for men? Resilient. How many people in here have ever experienced an injury or illness that affected their ability to train, right? So many of you. And it affects the way that we view our bodies. It affects the way that we, that we view how strong and capable we are. How many of us have ever worked with someone or even told a client, I've done this before, that, that one side of their body is weaker than the other, that they're unstable, that they're bone on bone, that they should be in pain, right? All of these things affect how a woman views her body. And finally, ownership and autonomy. Did she grow up in a household where what she said, what she wore, what she ate, what she did was closely policed? Is she a mother? Is she a caregiver? Does she feel like her body belongs to her children or her spouse or her partner, right? Does she feel like she's in charge and gets to make decisions about her body? So as you can see, there's a whole lot more to body image than just the way a woman looks. And before we dive into why, I'm going to talk a little bit about my background and why this is so important to me. So I'm a former gym owner. I co-owned a brick-and-mortar gym in Lexington, Kentucky for four years before I went full-time Girls Gone Strong. I've been in the fitness industry since about 2004, 2005. I'm a certified strength and conditioning specialist, former figure competitor who dabbled in powerlifting, and co-founder and owner of Girls Gone Strong. So this is me, February 2004, 19-year-old college student. That was when I had my aha moment and decided I wanted to get in shape. I didn't really know what that meant, but I knew it sounded good at the time. So I hired a personal trainer, worked with him for about six weeks and saw some results, but as a poor college student, couldn't afford to work with him much longer, but got interested in fitness that way. And about eight months later, started dating a guy at the gym who was a trainer, which is much more economical. <laughs> He was a competitive powerlifter and bodybuilder, and I was thrust into the world of intense exercise very quickly. I instantly started competing in powerlifting and figure. Picture on the left is uh, right before my competition in 2006. I looked so angry because I haven't had carbs in about 12 weeks. 
The one on the right is in 2008. So I competed in figure for three years, 2006, 7, and 8. After my last figure competition in 2008, my body rebounded. It rebounded really badly after each competition, but 2008 was a bit different. I went to the doctor, and I was diagnosed with Hashimoto's hypothyroidism, so I have autoimmune thyroid disease, polycystic ovarian syndrome, and adrenal dysfunction. So this is spring of 2009. I've been interested in fitness for five years, and up until this point, I've literally been able to decide what I'm going to do with my body. I cut my carbs a little bit, I do a little more cardio. My body changes the way that I want it to change. And all of a sudden, it wasn't responding to any of this anymore. And I looked in the mirror and I didn't even recognize my body. And much less, I was 24 years old and I felt so physically depressed, I could hardly get up off the couch to get a glass of water. And for the last five years, I had been getting so much <clears throat> affirmation and attention for the way that my body looked. Everyone was like, oh my gosh, you look amazing, you look so great, you're so lean, and all of a sudden that was ripped away from me and there was nothing I could do about it. So I decided, okay, if I can't be the really lean girl, I'm gonna be the really strong girl. And so I started competing, uh, got back into powerlifting. So I competed in powerlifting meet, took the little bit of energy that I had and channeled it into training for powerlifting, competed in a meet in spring of 2009, hit some PRs, had great results, and was like, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to be really, really strong. Kept training for powerlifting. Numbers weren't going up. Uh, couldn't figure out what exactly was going on. So I drove up to, I live in Kentucky, so I drove up to Indianapolis and worked with some guys named Mike Robertson and Bill Hartman. They told me I had built a big house of strength on a teeny tiny foundation. So we kind of circled back to the basics and started building up my foundation. And by end of 2011, things were awesome. I had my Hashimoto's a bit under control, my PCOS under control. I was feeling better. I was getting stronger. I had felt more comfortable in my body. And then I hit my second wall. January 4th, 2012, my dad died unexpectedly. I found out he was sick on a Saturday night, and he died on a Wednesday morning. Two weeks later, I was deadlifting in the gym, and I injured my back, and that kicked off two years of chronic pain. I could hardly tie my shoes without crying. I was a gym owner at this time and a trainer, and I could hardly tie my shoes or demonstrate any exercises for my clients without being in pain. Seven months after that, I left a six-year relationship, left a business and a home we had together, and moved back home with my family. So 2012 was a really difficult year for me. And believe it or not, nutrition and exercise was not my number one priority. So I ended up gaining a bit of weight. And by the uh, end of 2012, spring of 2013, I was at a Girls Gone Strong event. And I was with these women who were deadlifting double their body weight and doing weighted pull-ups. And I was on the ground doing breathing exercises in dead bug because I was in so much pain. So I went to the bathroom and I ended up stepping on a scale in the bathroom. And uh, my weight had gone up to the point where I was only a pound and a half less than I had been when I had started my fitness journey nine years before. So to me, seeing that number being almost exactly the same as where I had been nine years before, I felt like a total failure. I felt like all my hard work was out the window. Obviously, my body looks a bit different because I had put on so much muscle mass. But to me, that was an objective uh, you know, confirmation that I was a failure. And it wasn't just me that thought so. I started dealing with criticism from strangers, from my community, and from my peers. So at this point, I've been in fitness for over nine years. I have a gym, I have Girls Gone Strong, I have a seminar business, I had been blogging and had stuff on YouTube. I started having strangers on YouTube ask me what was wrong with my body and why I wasn't as lean as I used to be. There were women in my community who told other women not to come to my gym because they might look like me, as if that was such a horrible thing. And I was at a fitness conference hosted at my gym, and another trainer, who we had, or a, a speaker that we had asked to come speak, stood in my office and insinuated to my staff that I was fat. And at the time, that really hurt my feelings. I no longer subscribe to the idea that fat is the worst thing that we can call a woman, but it was so clear that he was trying to hurt my feelings. And here's the thing. My body isn't even that far outside the norm of what we consider to be fit. And what do I mean by that? 
If you take this, ex this exercise, this comes from Dr. Larissa Mercado Lopez. She is a certification curriculum developer with Girls Gone Strong and also a professor of women's studies at Fresno State. Google fit woman and see what comes up. Look at these bodies. They all look the same. They're young, they're lean, they're feminine presenting, they're white, they don't have any visible disabilities. They all look the same. And media scholar Jean Kilborn says that we only process about 8% of images that we see consciously, so we see 4,000 to 10,000 images a day between social media, traditional forms of media, and we only process 8% of that consciously. So four to 10,000 times a day, the women that you're working with are processing these images subconsciously about what their bodies are supposed to look like. Again, young, white, lean, heterosexual, feminine presenting, cisgender, meaning the gender I identify as matches the sex I was assigned at birth. This is what we see all the time. And when we see these images four to 10,000 times a day, and are processing 92% of it subconsciously, it is shaping and conditioning what we believe to be right and true and good and what a fit body looks like and who fitness is for. Can you imagine someone walking in your gym who's 50 pounds or 100 pounds or 150 pounds over these images that we see? What if she's that size and she's also older? Do you think she feels comfortable in the gym? Do you think she feels welcome? Do you think she feels like she can go in there and not be stared at or leered at or harassed, right? What if she's that size and she's older and she's trans? What if she's that size and older and trans and a woman of color? Do you think she's going to feel comfortable and like these spaces are for her? So there's a reason that all of this, these things affect women's body image and it has to do with what we've been conditioned to believe about our bodies. So first, things first, we believe that our bodies must look a certain way in order to be worthy. So we're told that we're supposed to be small, but only in certain places. We're supposed to be lean, but not too lean, because that's gross. We're supposed to be curvy, but not fat, because that's certainly the worst thing a woman could possibly be. We're supposed to be toned, but not too muscular, because then we look like a man. And that our bodies and our appearance are more important than everything. So can you all think of some ideas or ways that you've seen this show up with your clients? Can you pass me that, Kenneth? Can you pass me that? Thank you. Can you all think of some ideas or ways that this might, these ideas might show up with your clients? Yeah. Pa pass it back to you. Whoop! <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, got bad hands. Uh, yeah, so sometimes when um, somebody is trying to lose weight or get leaner, they'll say, well, if they fluctuate, you know, it's a process, and they'll say, well, I'm a failure because I haven't hit my goal within a period of time. So that's one way. Mm -hmm. Anybody around. else? I'll just be the cute. How does this show up with your clients? I don't want to get bulky. I don't want to get bulky. Exactly. How many of you all have heard a client say that? Yes, I don't want to lift weights because I don't want to get bulky because there's one right way to have a body, right? What else? Culturally. Go ahead. The Asian, my Asian clients. Oh, yeah. Mothers and fathers, not one inch of... No. Yeah. Absol no Absolutely. He said they did their culture, right? The culture they were raised in. He, said, uh, he mentioned Asian culture specifically. Their bodies aren't supposed to uh, appear muscular because they're supposed to be small. I work with college women who, uh, who we, we track their weight so that we can tell if there is something emotionally going on with them. Um, if we see a big gain or drop, uh, we know to worry about them. And they will, on a day when they're getting weighed, we have to remind them, like, you don't have to look at the number, and people have emotional difficulty stepping on a scale. Absolutely. I was talking to, uh, yeah, we can do one more, and then. I was just going to say the advertising for some of the gyms, they want new people to come in, but they'll take, like, the fittest out of the fittest people and advertise that, when not everybody desires or looks like that. Yeah, absolutely. So he's saying we're using the fittest of the fittest images to advertise our gyms, but that's not what the majority of people look like who come to our gyms. I was talking with Dr. Susan Kleiner, who's an incredible sports nutritionist. She was the first nutritionist in the NFL, not first female, first one, period. Um, and she was telling me about some of the Olympic level athletes that she works with. And these women are incredible. They don't want to eat more than 1,500 calories a day because that's what they think their body's supposed to look like. So they're at the highest level and they're not wanting to eat for 
for performance, they're wanting to eat because they think their body's supposed to look a certain way. Number two, our bodies are for the pleasure and service of others. So this can show up in a lot of ways. This happens a lot. How many of you all have clients that say that they uh, don't want to come to the gym because they feel guilty taking time away from their kids? Hands up, hands up, hands up, right? How many of you all have ever had a male client say that? <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. How many of you all have heard the oxygen mask analogy that we should put on our own oxygen mask first and that women should take care of themselves so that they can take care of others, right? We're telling them literally to come to the gym and take care of themselves so that they can be in service of others. Guys don't go to the gym for bench day because they want to be a better husband and father, right? They go because they want to go and no one has ever questioned, right, that time away from their family. But women are taught that our bodies are for the pleasure and service of others. How many of you all have heard of the term male gaze? Okay, so this is a term coined by Laura Mulvey, and she says, again, that the majority of the images that we see in the media, the 4,000 to 10,000 images a day of women, are women depicted in objectified sexual ways that they're going to be found attractive by guys. So it doesn't matter if you're selling a magazine or a snack or a burger or I don't even know what's being sold here. <laughs> but what I do know is that it's a woman on her back with her hands being held down with four guys standing over top of her with strong implications of gang rape to sell sunglasses. By the way, the Dolce & Gabbana ad for sunglasses for guys is a guy looking really dapper and successful just wearing a pair of sunglasses. American Apparel, now open. 4,000 to 10,000 times a day we see these images. GQ magazine, four guys, again, dapper, handsome, successful, powerful, four women, mostly naked. And here's the thing, it's not, there's no problem with these women posing like this. There's no problem with women wanting to pose, wearing or not wearing whatever they want to wear. Right? It's their body. They get to do what they want with it. The problem is that when these are the only images that we see all day long celebrated everywhere. Number three, women have been conditioned to believe our bodies are public property and up for debate, scrutiny, and commentary. How many of you all have ever heard or said she needs to eat a sandwich? She's too skinny. Right? How many of you all have ever heard or said, who does she think she is wearing that? Whether it's because it's too provocative, she's too slutty, she doesn't have the body for it. There are literal uh, magazine articles, 30 things women over 30 can't wear anymore. Street harassment and assault. Again, 81% of women in the U.S. report experiencing street harassment. That number is as high as 98% in other places. 35% of women globally report their assault, right? And we know that that's vastly underreported. Pregnant and postpartum bodies. How many of you all have heard comments? Uh, women, how many of you all have been pregnant or postpartum? And how many of you all got comments on your bodies? Are you doing that? Should you be doing that? Should you be working out? Why aren't you working out? You look so big. Are you sure you aren't having twins? You look so small. I'm concerned about you. Should you be eating that? Is that okay? constantly. And then when a woman has a baby, we act like the biggest accomplishment is that she doesn't look like she had a baby, as if she didn't just grow a human. I promise you that's not the most impressive thing she's done the last year, is look like she hasn't had a baby. Breastfeeding women. Women who breastfeed in public are subject to harassment and scrutiny and governance and forced to go in bathrooms and feed their babies in bathroom stalls. Right? There are so many ways that women feel like and see that are on a consistent basis that our bodies are up for debate, scrutiny, and commentary. Look at magazine covers. They're picking apart celebrities who fit the mold of the bodies that we were talking about earlier. They're Frankensteining the perfect woman together, taking Kim Kardashian's butt and somebody else's lips, right? Even the people who've achieved the highest level are still not good enough. And we see it all the time. And I get the question a lot, well, don't guys have body image issues too? Yes, 
Absolutely, and there's something inherently different about men being expected to be bigger, stronger, faster, and more powerful, and women being expected to be smaller, thinner, leaner, quieter, and disappear. Number four, we're not supposed to take up space. How many of you all have clients who feel intimidated in the weight room? Female clients, they feel like they shouldn't be there, right? So many women feel like the weight room is not for them. We're told that we're supposed to be quiet and nice and cross our legs and not take up space in the weight room, right? Even conferences, how many women are there? How many women are speaking? How many women are on committees? How many women are asked to be in positions of power? When you consistently see so few seats at the table for women, it's reinforcing the idea that women don't belong in these spaces, and that's just not true. <clears throat> and what happens if you don't conform? Well, I've been told I'm an embarrassment to women, that I look like a dude, that I should lose 40 pounds, then I can talk, reinforcing the idea that only people with a certain body have valuable ideas and should speak or she's hysterical, irrational, crazy, a troublemaker. And here's the thing, it starts early. This is Girls Life magazine, targeted at 10 to 14 year old girls. Boys, boys, boys. Bikini blowout. Look cute now, your best beach body. It's hard to see from here, but it says like, toned arms, lean legs, and major confidence. Your dream hair, wake up pretty as if that's really important. <laughs> and here's my favorite, are you sending him the right signals? Hey, 10-year-old girl, are you doing the right things to make sure that that guy that you like is enjoying the signals that you're sending him sexually? Are you making yourself sexually available to guys in the way that they want you to? Like, that's literally on the magazine cover for 10 to 14-year-old girls. And if you look at Boys Life magazine, it talks about adventure and possibility, and it, I promise you it does not tell them that they need to wake up pretty. These are the mes messages that we're sending young girls. And here's the thing, we can blame social media all we want, but Dr. Leslie Sim, child psychologist and director of eating disorders at the Mayo Clinic, says that moms most likely have the most important influence on their daughter's body image. So, what does this mean? Why is this important? Well, 80% of women in the US and 81% of women in Canada report being dissatisfied with their bodies. So it is no surprise that 81% of 10-year-old girls are afraid of being fat. What are the implications of this? Well, 79% of young girls report opting out of activities that are important to them because they don't like the way their body looks. So this means they're not going out for sports, they're not raising their hand in class, they're not trying out for the school play, they're not running for class president. And imagine, this starts at eight, nine, and 10 years old. How are we stifling their potential by them not participating in these activities, starting that early for the rest of their life. What is that, how does that trajectory change, right? We all talk about like a 1% improvement or a 1% um, struggle, right? And what does that look like over time? That's what's happening to these young girls. And women, 85% of women report the same thing. How many of you all know someone who has missed out on an important life event like a wedding or reunion because they don't like the way they look or they don't have something to wear? How many of you all know someone who does not like to wear a bathing suit or go to the pool or beach because they don't like their body? And how many of you all know someone who avoids being in pictures or videos or always stands in the back? Women are literally not participating in their own lives because they don't think they look good enough to. And if you don't care about women and girls, we can talk about your bottom line for a second. 
So we did a recent survey at Girls Gone Strong asking women about their negative experiences with coaches and trainers. Of the women we surveyed, 97% of them said that they didn't stay with their trainer after the negative experience. 16% of them switched gyms altogether so they didn't have to see that trainer anymore. And only 3.5% of them told the trainer the truth about why. Most of them said, I don't have the time, I don't have the money, this doesn't fit my schedule, my kids are starting school again. So there is a massive impact on trainers and gyms. So what does this mean for you? What does this mean for you as a coach or trainer? It means that you are on the front lines of these conversations with women about their bodies. You probably spend more time with them than anyone else they they work with outside of their actual work setting or their family, you're probably having more conversations with them about their body, and you can be a tremendous force for good in your clients' lives. So what can you do? Number one, do not assume a client's abilities based on how her body looks. So if you're not going to assume her abilities, what are you going to do instead? Ken, I might need you to... <laughs> oh, you no, to well, you don't have to answer, but you can toss no. it. What would you do if you're not going to assume her abilities based on how her body looks? What are you going to do? It's, it's, not, a, it's not a trick question. Assess her, absolutely. I cannot tell you the number of times that women have come to us saying that their trainers either uh, put them through a workout that absolutely crushed them because it, they looked like they were in shape or they assumed that they couldn't do anything because they were in a larger body and the trainer had this idea of what they were going to be able to do or not able to do. So of the women that we surveyed, the women who were underestimated said they felt angry, they felt insulted, they felt frustrated, and they felt like they couldn't reach their potential. And of the women who were overestimated, they felt apprehensive and unsafe. And them feeling overestimated was highly correlated with them also uh, ending up getting injured. Don't tolerate, encourage, or participate in any body shaming or bashing. This includes your own. How many of you have responded to a client who says something negative about their body by commiserating with them and also saying something negative about your body? Happens all the time, right? So if you're in this environment, particularly because they so often look up to us too and think that we're in such great shape and we have it all together, then if we commiserate with them about our bodies and they're thinking, wow, she or he's in really great shape, I wonder what they think of my body, right? You are agreeing with the idea that it's okay to bash other people's bodies and your own body by participating in this behavior. Don't use shame-based motivators. How many people have heard uh, bikini season's coming up, you've got to work out to get that bikini body? How many of you all have seen that advertised somewhere? Come to the gym, because bikini season's right around the corner. You've heard of trainers talking about, you know, five more push-ups to get those tank top arms. There was another trainer, a client of ours, reported that her gym was near a bakery and the trainer, would, if he saw anyone go into the bakery, would actually punish them with more uh, cardio or something like burpees or whatever it was if he saw them go into the bakery to get food. So that trainer is reinforcing not only are these foods bad, you're not supposed to eat them, but if you do, you're going to get this punishment, right, to burn off what you've eaten. So if you're not going to use shame-based motivators, what are you going to do instead? Will you pass that? Um, you want to eat that, that's, you're going to, you can go ahead and eat it, but you're going to have to do this and this and this to work that off. Um, when it comes to motivation, uh, one of the first things you have to do is find out what it is that they want. They want. That's the first thing. I got at least an hour interview with every client. 98% of my clients are women. And... The thing is, what is it you want? I see so many guys going to the gym, and we're going to do this. We're Can you all hear him? Sorry, will today you Today we're going to bench press. <laughs> um, is that really what she wants? Does she want to look mm. like that? What is her end goal? It's that that we have to take a look at, then make the assessment, and then program a, a, a particular um, workout regimen for that end result. 
and then we're going to do subsequent testing and that sort of thing after that as well. But um, yeah, find the out what their actual goals are. It is not that revolutionary. Yes, Ken, sorry, yeah. pass it. A friend of mine who's actually a trainer herself moved to a new city and went to a gym and she was just wanting to check out working out and the guy kept wanting to take her body fat percentage and told her that he could really help her lose the last five pounds if she wanted to. She's like, I never mentioned that. I didn't come to you for that and that's not what my goals are. So uh, what I do is uh, I focus on what they're doing really, really good early. So for instance, let's say it's a brand new client and it's our first workout. You move that up, yeah. Maybe. Let's say it's a brand new client, and it's, it's her first workout. And let's say she's really sedentary and, and morbidly obese. And let's say the only thing that she can do is sit at a 90 degree angle with a, you know, in a squat on in an actual chair or like a, uh, a block and get up, you know, with grip posture. I'm like, okay, that's great because the majority of the population, you know, they're slumped over or they, do something that's biomechanically incorrect. And, but, but you have to find something that's positive and focus on that and stay focusing on the positive. And then it gets easier because as they get results, then you just talk about what the results that they're getting. So like after a month, you know, you lost seven pounds in that awesome, how's that feel and, and talk about it more. But positive from the very beginning until years and years and years. That's what I do. Yeah, absolutely. Could you all hear that? He was talking about from the very beginning, from their first session with you, focus on what they're doing really well so they feel good and excited to come to your gym. Holly? Ken, sorry, I'm sorry. Okay. Yes. Performance-based performance motivation. Absolutely. Talking about what their body can do versus what their body looks like. Again, don't... Uh, could, I can never say that word, catastrophize, highlight the awfulness or focus primarily on weaknesses. I was in a car accident a couple years ago, went to see a chiropractor in my city who's quite talented and very knowledgeable. And I don't know if it was because of the, what I do for a living, but the entire time he pointed out all my deficits, everything that was wrong with me, everything that could be better, right? He's saying, oh, see, when I do this and then it corrects this and then this is wrong and then you know, this is turned off over on this side. I walk, if I had not been a trainer or coach with the knowledge that I have, I would have walked out there thinking that I was a disaster and an injury waiting to happen, right? So do not highlight the awfulness. And I have done this myself. I've said, you're weak on this side, right? This isn't functioning the way that it's supposed to. You have this type of dysfunction. Are you sure you're not in back pain, right? Because you've got this thing going on with your posture, okay? These suggestions matter. These words matter. What we're saying to our clients affect the way that they feel about their bodies. One of my friends talks about her clients, she talks about their strong side and their stronger side, right? Not their strong and their weak. She talks about their strong and their stronger. Do listen, reflect back, and validate how your client is feeling. When a client says, I feel fat today, or I'm so gross, right? Our, that makes us uncomfortable. So our first reaction is, you're not fat, right? And so what does that do? Number one, that makes it sound like fat is a really terrible thing for a woman to be. Number two, it completely dismisses her concerns so she doesn't feel heard at all. And number three, it, it reassures her that for the moment she's made the cut, right? She's not there yet, but you know, she's thinking like maybe if I am, maybe if my body changes, right, then I will be. So it's important to listen, reflect back, and validate. I'm really sorry you're feeling that way. That sounds really hard, right? Like and getting to the root of why she's feeling that way is so important. And then saying, you know, I know that you're feeling this way. I mean, I'd like to offer another perspective if that's okay with you. You crushed those squats earlier today. You're absolutely killing it. You've been so consistent. I am so proud of you, right? I'm not saying, no, you're not. I'm saying, I hear you and that sounds hard. And I'd like to, to tell you what I see if you'd like, if you're open to that. Use positive language, highlight the awesomeness, and keep it aligned with your client's goals. We get asked the question all the time, is it okay to compliment or comment on, on someone's fat loss or on their body or their appearance, right? That's a little bit of a tricky question. Because if we constantly have the focus on their appearance, then it's going to reinforce that that's the most important thing about them or the thing that you're most proud of. So then, if they end up getting off track a little bit, not coming to the gym, not eating the way that they've been eating, and they gain a bit of weight back, are you still going to be proud of them? 
Are they going to be ashamed to walk into your gym because the whole time you've been focusing on the physical progress that they've been making? So it's so important. If your client comes to you because she wants to increase her deadlift or you're working with an athlete who wants to improve her performance, do not compliment weight loss for the sake of weight loss. All that does is reinforce the idea that smaller, thinner, leaner is better. And then you end up with Olympic level athletes who don't want to eat to fuel their body because they think that their body has to look a particular way to be valuable. So keep it aligned with their goals. If they come to you because they want to improve their deadlift, talk about how awesome their deadlift looks. Talk about how they're crushing their accessory work that's going to improve their deadlift. Talk about how much stronger they look, right? Do vary your compliments and words of encouragement. So again, if we, because even with the performance thing, that can go awry as well, right? When I was, again, had started having chronic back pain, wasn't able to deadlift anymore, I felt like that my body wasn't worthy or valuable either. I couldn't be lean, so I decided to be strong. I couldn't be strong, that was taken away from me what was left, right? So if we're only complimenting performance, that is also an issue. There are so many things you can say to your clients and compliment about your clients that will help them feel good about themselves. You've been so consistent lately, I'm so proud of you. You've really been giving it your all. Or the opposite, hey, you knew when you needed to rest the other day and I'm so proud of you for tuning into your body. You have been such a great teammate or classmate lately, you're really showing up for other people. You look so happy, you look so healthy, you look so strong, you look so confident, right? All of these compliments we can give to our clients and then they start to feel really proud of themselves in a number of ways. And then it's not just about the way their body looks. It's not just about what they can do in the gym. They start to think of themselves as more whole human beings with more to offer the world than the way that their body looks or what their body can do. Do include your client in the decision-making process whenever possible. This is a collaboration. We take a person-focused approach at Girls Gone Strong, which means they are the expert on their body and you are there as a Sherpa or a guide to bring them along. You've done this before. You're going to carry a lot of the load for them. You're gonna help show them the way. By the way, I got that Sherpa thing from Mark Fisher at Mark Fisher Fitness, who's awesome. Um, you're gonna carry the load. You've done this before. You're the guide. They still have to do the work, but you're gonna be there to help bear some of that along the way right? You're going to offer them support that is equal to or greater than the challenge that they're experiencing at the time. So include your client in the decision-making process. Really simple way to do this is when you show them an exercise, immediately give them an option for a regression or a progression. Just show it to them. And that way they get to decide, oh yeah, this feels good. I'm ready to make this a little bit harder. Mm, this is feeling a little bit off. I'm going to make this a little bit easier, right? Include them in the decision-making process about what their goals are for themselves, how you can help them get there, what they think is realistic and achievable for them. And then even in the daily workouts, give them options and include them in the decision-making process. This gives them ownership and autonomy. They're going to be more bought into your program. They're going to trust you more. Right? They're going to feel excited about participating in it. So include them in the decision-making process whenever possible on a macro scale and also on a micro scale. Do be mindful of how you're coaching. We're going to talk about this a lot. I have another session today at 2 p.m. in the Maryland room. We're going to be diving into specifically what this looks like with case studies of clients. Think about your language. What language are you using with them? When and how do you touch your client? Did you get consent before you manually cued your client or put your hands on them? What's your proximity to your client? How do you think a client who's a survivor of sexual assault feels when she's on, the ba on her back doing a glute bridge and you're standing over top of her leering, right? What's your proximity to your client? Where are you standing when they're doing a Romanian deadlift? Your eye contact, where are your eyes? As coaches and trainers, we have to constantly be looking at our clients and assessing them, but there's a way to do it in a way that's gonna help them feel comfortable, and there's a way to do it that's completely inappropriate. And again, if she's a survivor of sexual harassment or assault, how do you think she's going to feel if she feels like you're leering at her or her body? Training environment. What's the music like in your gym? What's the language that other people are using around your clients? Is it cool to tell somebody to quit being a, and lift the weight, right? Tell them to quit being a
perfect or whatever. Like, I mean, th- like this is what we hear, what women often hear in the weight room. And that's the environment that they think they're in. So what is the training environment like? And then exercise selection, same kind of thing. When we, um, again, we'll be talking about this more at the round table, but there were 78, 78% of women that we surveyed said that there was at least one exercise that made them uncomfortable. And it doesn't mean that the same exercise makes every woman inc- uncomfortable. If she's busty, she might not like stuff where she's lying on her stomach, right? Or on an incline where her, she feels like her breasts are pushed up to her neck. Or, you know, other women, I had, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, a person in our closed Facebook group uh, for health and fitness professionals has a client who won't do any exercises lying on her back and she doesn't know why and her client hasn't, won't talk to her about it and she just doesn't know. So you have to be mindful of your exercise selection. Is, you know, a crowded weight room and there's a bunch of people behind her and you're asking her to do Romanian deadlifts. Maybe she's fine with that and maybe she's not. So you want to be mindful of your exercise selection and how you're coaching. So... This one applies more to people who work with Gen Pop clients, and it goes to what he said earlier in terms of using a wide variety of images on your website. So one of the ways that we've done that at Girls Gone Strong is we've spotlighted our community members. And so we are consistently posting pictures and videos and photos of women of all different shapes, sizes, ages, races, ability levels, so that everyone feels like health and fitness is for them. And to be clear, ultimately, you cannot make your client feel a particular way, right? You're not responsible for how they feel or their reactions, but what you can do is create an environment in which they feel strong and capable and see the possibilities for their lives and their bodies. This is Fusako Yokotobi. She is a 71-year-old Japanese-American retired librarian and breast cancer survivor. She is also a power lifter. She's a former GGS coaching client, and she got into power lifting because she found Girls Gone Strong. And she saw women of her shape and her size and her age doing really cool things, and she thought, I want to try that. That's possible for me. And she hired us to work with, uh, to, hired us, to work with us at Girls Gone Strong Coaching, and now you can see her. Look how happy she looks. She said she comes from a culture where women are not supposed to be strong. They're not supposed to want to gain muscle, but she doesn't care because she's doing what's happy, what makes her happy, what's good for her, and she saw what was possible because of the work that we're doing at Girls Gone Strong. So you can't make someone feel a particular way, but you can cultivate an environment in which they feel safe and comfortable and strong and capable and resilient and take ownership and autonomy over their lives and their bodies. So that's all I have for you all today. If you want to learn more, we have a free Facebook group called GGS Coaching and Training Women. If you have your phone, you can pull it out right now. Um, It's a awesome Facebook group focused specifically for health and fitness professionals who work with women. It is totally free. We invest a lot of time and resources in there. We've got experts, PhDs, OBGYNs, pelvic health physiotherapists in there answering people's questions all the time. <clears throat> and if you want to go a little bit deeper into some of the tactical stuff, like case studies and such, we have a free course, How to Help Female Clients with Body Image, Unrealistic Expectations, and the Comparison Trap. And you can enroll in that, again, totally free, girlsgunstrong.com, body-image-course. So thank you all so much for being here. <laughs> I really appreciate it. I know there are other awesome things going on right now, so it is not lost on me that you're here. So thank you so much. Thanks to the NSCA, to Courtney, to Brad, to Scott, to the Women's Committee. I think we have maybe two or three minutes for questions. Yeah, I have a question. So how would you approach a woman who is saying um, negative things about another client or maybe um, when you're making suggestions, they're saying something that goes counter to that person's goals. Mm-hmm. Oh, sorry, when you say you're saying something that goes counter to their goals, what do you mean by that? Yeah, sorry? so maybe they want to stay accountable while they're on vacation, mm-hmm. and uh, another woman will say, are you not going to let her gain weight while she's on vacation? Something like that. Mm, interesting. 
So uh, if someone's saying something negative about, so first of all, I think it's really important to have a policy of no body <clears throat> shaming or bashing. I think that's super, a su super important policy to have in your gym or your weight room or uh, with the, the athletes or clients that you're working with. So when somebody says something like that, you can just say, hey, we don't talk like that around here. Or, hey, we're better than that. You know, we don't need to talk about other women's bodies like that. It's just a really simple, gentle, but firm boundary that you can set with your clients um, and just remind them, like, that's not necessary. You know, like, we don't talk like that around here or you wouldn't want someone to say that about you. Or so It's just a, like, super gentle but firm boundary that you consistently set with your clients and over time, they'll start noticing that they're thinking it or getting ready to say it, and they'll stop themselves. Mm -hmm. So you were talking earlier about um, focusing on the goals with your athletes and your clients. Now, with me, I don't actually train any women who are, um, you know, performance athletes. Everybody is just improving body composition, you know, attorneys, physicians, um, principals, you know, people like that. So when, you know, they're going through a rough time at their jobs, which is pretty much all of my clients, um, and they start to kind of fall off a little bit, you know, how do you stay focused when they come to me and, you know, I see what they see and they see what they see, and I don't address it at all. I, don't, I just don't even talk about it. I'm, I'm like, hey, how's your day? You know, how's it going, blah, blah, blah. But when they bring it up, and they, they always bring it up sometime during that, session yeah you know I had a rough week this week so and so and blah blah, blah and I kind of drank a little bit too much or I ate the wrong things how do I kind of you know go about that because what I typically do is is kind of say you know this is a marathon not a sprint so you know don't worry about the the little battles you know as long as we win the war that's pretty much, you know, all we can focus on. But is there anything more than that that I can say? Yeah, absolutely. So it sounds like you're doing a great job. You're reminding them of the long-term goal. I think it's really important <clears throat> to focus on what your client is capable of doing. So kind of thinking of it like, uh, like, hey, it sounds like you're really busy at work right now. Maybe your main focus shouldn't necessarily be on your nutrition or what you're doing in the gym. Can we press pause on some of the you know, goals that you have for yourself right now and shift your, so you can shift your priority to work or to your family or to whatever you need to do? We're not gonna stop training, right? We're just gonna shift your goals a little bit. So maybe if they're coming in the gym three or four days a week, they can start doing two. And then you can also give them a couple of simple like nutrition things that they could do. So, hey, instead of, for example, if your clients count macros, you could say, hey, instead of worrying about, like, logging and tracking your stuff, this week the only things I want you to focus on are making sure that you have protein and vegetables with every meal or making sure that you're drinking water. Sounds like you're already doing the right things in terms of just reminding them that this is a long-term thing and what happens today doesn't matter as much as what's happening a year or five years or ten years from now. But I think working with them to figure out what's realistic is so important. So many of our clients, if they can't do it perfectly, they decide that they're not going to do it at all, right? to say, hey, instead of like totally giving up and throwing in the towel because you can't do exactly what you were doing before, how do we just dial it back a little bit? If you were like at a nine in terms of effort before, how can we dial it back to a six or a seven so that you're still doing something and you're still staying consistent with that habit, uh, but it, it fits into your life a little bit better? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you mentioned you want to stay consistent with your clients' goals, but when you have, if you have female clients who come to you and their only goals are body image or composition, mm -hmm. how do you help shift their mindset or what strategies have you used to shift their mindset more towards performance knowing as a fitness professional that that's obviously going to help their body composition. Yeah, absolutely. So he said, if your client comes to you and their only goal is body composition, how do you help kind of shift their, um, their goals or their perspective towards maybe a more performance-based goal. I'm getting kicked off the stage. So this one's really simple. You cultivate the type of environment where that stuff is encouraged. So you can't change it in a single session, right? You're not gonna fix her or make her wanna change her goals like within the first week or two. But if she consistently comes to your gym, sees women who feel good, who are training hard, who are excited about what their body can do, and she's being encouraged and complimented in that way, you're gonna see a slow shift over time. You can also encourage her to find, uh, follow people on social media that make her feel good about her body instead of bad about her body. So doing a social media kind of pruning is really valuable as well. All right, thank you all so much.